meditations on the natural world, direct observation, attentiveness, listening to silence. Boundless space, wilds, solitude, nothingness, orientation north, get lost physically and conceptually. Break vital new ground, give form to thought, create experiences for my public, open up my public's perception. Fuse art, architecture and science, evoke austerity of nature, create distilled poetry, a visual parallel of intense quiet. Clarity that is profoundly contemplative. Risk taking, don't cling to what I know, forget rules, chance openings. Study details of water and ice in the environment, play and experiment with it in my studio. Enable water and ice to act itself in the work. They have a collaborative nature. Research in the studio involves standing back, observing. Water and ice, both medium and subject in the work. I can recall play with water as a child, exploring streams and big river. Work points obliquely to environmental issues highlighting world's most challenging problem, threat to our most precious natural resource, most vital of all earthy compounds, water and ice. Their ebb and flow over time helped form our world. Always follow the work. Whatever evaluation we finally make of a stretch of land, no matter how profound or accurate, we will find it inadequate. The land retains an identity of its own, still deeper and more subtle than we can know. Our obligation toward it then becomes simple, to approach with an uncalculating mind, with an attitude of regard, to try to sense the range and variety of its expression, its weather, and colours and animals. To intend from the beginning to preserve some of the mystery within it as a kind of wisdom to be experienced, not questioned. And to be alert for its openings for that moment when something sacred reveals itself within the mundane and you know the land knows you are there. Up at Store Point in Sutherland, uh, we have a, a bathy right by the sea. It's a wonderful place to be. It's a place where we go to think, plan our next work, and just generally rest and be inspired.
it it happened completely by accident uh, that we found this place and uh, the lighthouse stores and it became a place to meditate, to um, chill out, to you know it had everything we needed. A uh, place, a thinking space, as it were, in between teaching at the university, in between um, shows, etc. I've, over the years I've gained so much from being there on the coast. It's wonderful waking up in the morning and feeling the sea right beside it. And on a stormy day, the really stormy day, the, the um, spray comes over the bothing. Collecting driftwood is a part of the routine in the north because we don't have any electricity and because we're by the shore we have plenty of free wood. That's the wall drawing, an elevation of the lighthouse up the road. This was this body was built by the lighthouse board, in fact, and that's why it's called the lighthouse stores because it was used to store things for the lighthouse when first it was built. I, I'm still very much enchanted by that area. It, it's been a very, um, it's been a key element in the work. You know, there's incredibly minimal landscapes uh, without trees, wonderful coastlines. Yes, it, it's really acted as a catalyst over the years. My obsessive interest in water lies deep within my personality and ancestral background. My mother's people, the Fergusons, came from the remote archipelago of St Kilda. This seminal island and its grouping of stacks, far out in the Atlantic, fired my imagination from early childhood, as did my mother's striking accounts of living there off and on as a child often left with relatives by her father, who came from the island but had emigrated to Glasgow and continued to travel back and forth in his yacht. Owing to this personal history, my inbuilt compass always points me north and to remote locations. While this island within directly influenced earlier stages of the work, shown at the Arnold Feeney and Talbot Rice Gallery, for example, I can still identify its power within my current practice. I'm an environmental artist and I create experiences for my public. I'm aiming to open up perceptions and understanding of how our environment functions. My work is a fusion of art, architecture and science with water and ice, both medium and subject. I'm endeavouring to create an experience of seeing, drawing people in through the senses and encouraging them to consider what is worth, to marvel at its visual effect and to appreciate its universal and sustaining properties. Living by the coast when I was a child, um, rather than toys, I can remember as a child playing with water. And so the, uh, from earliest memories, I, can, um, I really enjoyed that sense of wonder at water and the movement of water. Ogilvy sets out to inspire. To see how she does this, we must appreciate the range of her work, from stunning films made 
on location in Ilulisat, on the far west coast of Greenland. To her studio processes, where the playful and the intense are mixed, and on to the resolution in grand installations where we read patterns flowing across her screens and filling the atmosphere encircling our bodies. Liz was one of those ambitious artists who were invited to the DCA by Katrina Brown and sticks within the collective memory to an extent that folk are still talking about that work. The, you know, the, the, the power of that on me personally was just such a beautiful, beautiful show. Water has a profound meaning for me. It's my natural element. I speak its language and I've been raised to its horizon. And my idea of quietness is to be immersed in the icy and dark water of an alpine lake. The same water that was previously ice.
For this show, I'm looking at water and rhythm and have been researching this for the last year. Um, and the more I discover about water, I think the more difficult it becomes and the more I realise that how little I know. For Gallery 2, I have worked with the, the taiko drummer, um, Japanese taiko drummer, Joji Hirata, and we have made a piece which I suppose portrays, um, in a more conceptual way, portrays um, the water, the whole water cycle. Um, so that um, piece in, in um, Gallery 2 um, really, I suppose, reflects the, the large installation in, in the main gallery, in the main space. By drawing people in through the senses, there is space to bring their own lives and understanding into the work. Through creating an artificial environment inside, my aim is to bring others' attention to the distance between their everyday life practices and elemental resources. Taking and isolating water from its natural habitat highlights its fundamental qualities and points back to its place of origin. And so, as an artist in inventing my own universe and language, I draw people in then step back, leaving no trace of myself. I'm interested in architecture as well, and I feel that um, I wanted a very minimal display with water enacting itself, as it were, and water being the main feature in the, in the piece. Uh, the, um, the water cycle um, is obviously one of the, the, the great rhythms. 
and I wanted within that to portray smaller rhythms, small, very crucial rhythms, which are um, universally known. The whole exhibition is designed to give people a very much um, enhanced view of water and hopefully confirm in their minds that water is something very precious and something that we have to care for. Reflecting on the studio, my late husband Bob and I were well qualified to take on any massive project as we both worked on an ambitious scale and also previously transformed a joiner's yard into a great home and studio in Leith, Edinburgh. Our search for new premises produced this definitive space and location in the form of the derelict 1930s cinema on the Fife Coast, North of Edinburgh. We spent two years pulling apart, then transforming it, with the generous help of John Hope Architects and excellent local builders. We weren't at all intimidated by the physical work, risk-taking and time required in the recycling of this building. And of course we've gained so much from this exceptional space and its site. For nearly 30 years, Sea Loft has provided both a sanctuary and a vibrant studio environment and it has become part of who we are. Being at home here at, um, in Kinghorn has had you know, tremendous influence in the work. And I have to say, you know, I love the place and I love the people here and uh, I've gained so much from it. Bob always recognised the value of um, studio visits by young artists and, and the, the fact that um, they would see how artists lived and worked and lived their lives. Uh, in the last few weeks of his life, I said to him, well, I'm going to start a residency in your name for young artists with young artists from Scotland, Scotland-based artists working alongside artists from young artists from Japan for a month in the summer and this um, residency also takes part place in Japan as well with with both Bob and Liz they used they talk to us young artists and they give us the importance, not that we deserve, but the importance that they might see in us and in our valid. So they give us a validity that otherwise probably we wouldn't have. Uh, my normal day is uh, I have another job and I don't have a studio. Then uh, my thinking and my limit is uh, decide. But, uh, this time or very special, it's good experience in my future. Being offered this residency, which was probably different from any other residency that I would, that I looked for or that I could have been invited to, was the uh, attention to developing not just your practice, but you as a person where Liz shared her network, where she invited her, her collaborators, her, her links to see our work um, and how that would aid our work to develop and flourish. I um, managed to acquire, for the princely sum of a penny, um, a warehouse in Kokodi Docks, um, quite close to my studio. And um, although it it was in good, excellent condition, but it was uh, it you know, there was a lot of junk inside and the partitions, etc., which had to be cleared out by myself and. Uh, 
um, a group of builders who did an excellent job and then uh, we built the installation in that. You know, this um, warehouse was uh, very large. It um, could house a huge um, range of uh, water cycle events happening at the same time. In a way, it set the pace for ideas, um, you know, up until now. And um, because, I, you know, I do believe in these uh, big experiments and it is a bit risky, but I, th I feel it gave me a lot of confidence in the ability to, um, in, in the vision to see what I wanted on, on that scale.
I've always followed my work and in recent years it has led me on a remarkable journey into the world of water in its solid phase. I'm increasingly drawn into its profound world and continue to be enthralled by all I read about the ecology and psychology of ice, as well as its esoteric history and, crucially, issues worldwide brought about by its melting. Elizabeth Ogilvie's distinguished career as an artist crystallises in Out of Ice. Her subtle entangling of filmmaking, installation, interdisciplinary research and fieldwork that she calls a kind of choreographic practice is a remarkable achievement. Having now reached an extraordinary level of internal complexity, how might it be used as a tool for thinking deeply about extreme environments. At the very moment when our own planet is itself threatening to become extreme, her work is tangible, accessible and immediate. A welcome art in unwelcoming times. In the cool vastness of P3, out of ice presented two expansive pools of water into which large ice blocks slowly melted, dispensing water drops which broke the still surface. Huge meditative panoramic real-time projections magnified transitions from ice to water, projected on the surrounding walls through physics principles. Luminous pieces of ice hung as if in mid-air. As the individual ice forms melted, they were replaced, therefore communicating the potential for positive human intervention in addressing climate change. Some of the metaphors of filmmaking, the freeze frame for example, embody the elemental sense we have from beyond art. It encourages us to slow down and see the world differently, with greater attention. The appeal to slowness is political as well as artistic, in a world that is accelerating to a point beyond understanding. Thank you. 
My recent installations evoke significant concerns around deep time, global warming and the Anthropocene. Beyond its visual and physical immersion, the work offers space for opinion, debate and agency, drawing on our contemporary engagement in the global ecological long game and a time horizon rarely explored in the arts. ICE has formed our environment and continues to do so, its presence is key to the future of our planet. It's in ice that the roots of our existence are found and where underneath the ice our future's uncharted history lies. My ongoing project, Out of Ice, offers me further investigation into ways of understanding ice and its place in the living whole. Over recent years, I've based myself annually in Ilulisat, aiming to explore ice in its various forms. This is a stunningly beautiful UNESCO World Heritage Site, uniquely important for long-term glaciological studies due to the enormous production of icebergs from the Cermak Gujaslake Glacier. Freezing and melting, clarity and confusion, organisation and turbulence. These are the wonderful polarities by which the cosmos thrives. What then is the secret imperative of polar melting, of the apocalyptic global warming amid which we now live? It is perhaps this, the melting that we have wantonly made through our greed and waste should shock us into a new awareness of ice of its place in the living whole, an awareness that might translate into new modes of being, less egocentric, more ecological. But the occult significance of Antarctic and Arctic thawing might be something else again, something more horrifying yet potentially more sublime. The human species, but an ambiguous instant in cosmological durations, might have already set unalterably in motion forces that will inevitably drown and dissolve the greed of men, as well as civilised beauty. Possibly this, the removal from the planet of the most destructive species ever to exist, is the truest and most tragic ecology, an end of wasteful death in the name of new life.
I've gradually built up friendships there, discovering how inhabitants flourish in the face of an extreme existence, reading nature, and how they're having to adjust to cultural and ecological shifts caused by climate change. Through working on the project and collaborating with Inuit and local residents in northwest Greenland, the Arctic environment and its people have cast a very strong spell over me, as have their stories about ice. Arctic residents' unique reading of ice has long been recognised and remains the pillar of their identity and resilience and their most valued intellectual treasure. They confirm the importance of the sublime northern emptiness and its central position in their lives, character and interaction with nature. Nil Simia Drapunga Mani do the Senate in a morning go on a Karisakto, somebody be yakto, a dowry, the commercial upon the second she shocked to so. Mani Arisakto, you so kindly in my young talk so in a simple psychoactive to my second. Be shoot the good cat, she does some work on a marriage Sangoyatomi, <laughs> And not The sea ice transforms not only the natural environment around Inuit, but also their internal landscape. With their guidance over time, I'm gradually gaining knowledge of ice, its physical properties and character, and its important role in the vital history of Arctic peoples. Inuit communities in Greenland live in a constantly changing environment and there is enormous potential to learn from them about documenting changes to ice. Hunters in the Arctic spend a lifetime learning to read the signs of land and sea and developing the skills needed for survival. For millennia this knowledge has been passed down from generation to generation. In the Greenlandic language, there seems to be no specific word for environment, presumably because they see themselves respectfully as a mere part of it and as privileged, very much in accord with Inuit perception of the environment as a revered partner. Everybody who lives in Greenland know about the ice, how ice is made. Ice, especially Greenlandic inland ice, is made by snow. Snowflake or snowflake, but between snowflakes there is, is microscopic uh, air bubble being captured and pressed down 12, 15 years ago, first time ever. In winter times, there was a no sea ice because of the water was 
warmer than usual. Then for each year we noticed the uh, iceberg getting smaller and smaller and lower and lower. Now uh, the average height of the icebergs is max 40 meter high compared for 12-15 years ago. 120 meter high and um, now uh, because of the glacier cl inside of the Illyricid ice field has been retreated approximately 20 kilometer. Uh, now it calving over the land and produce smaller icebergs for each year. Um, before the global warming around here in winter times, it normally uh, in, in the beginning of December, uh, sea ice covered all this area. So normally, uh, it's closed by sea ice, and uh, when there are sea ice, we walk on it, on it or dog sledding, and uh, hunting from the sea ice, fishing. But now, uh, sea ice is not not thick enough to uh, dog sled. What I know about the uh, ice and my knowledge, I have not transferred to my mm. kids. I have no possibility to transfer it be, uh, because of the change so fast. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, very difficult to try to explain the kids about uh, global warming. We just know and have noticed uh, there has been change. That's what I'm talking about before. Transparent eyes. Uh, there is no air bubbles inside. Like you can see, it's transparent. Compared this one, lot of air, compressed air. Then you can hear when I do this, it's explode. Very easily, it's cracked. Compare this one, nothing happened. Then you can see air bubbles inside, like this, uh, like tiny lines. And believe me, it's cool, cold on my hands. <laughs> The Greenlandic people and the Greenlandic society is very good to adapt yes. for each decade. We have no choice, we have yes. to. Then uh, we try to live one day, one day at a time. Because it's very difficult to plan ahead. In 2013, my colleague, the filmmaker Rob Page, accompanied me to film ICE and Inuit and Greenlandic friends and collaborators, talking about ICE and changes in Northern Greenland. This footage acted as a portal to the installation in my London exhibition, along with footage of ICE filmed among the ice flows, bergs and glaciers around Ilulissat and at the Greenlandic ice cap.
Greenland is a physically demanding place in which to conduct field work, especially among the ice flows of the Cermic Gujaslaut glacier. Challenges in the work were also as much intellectual as physical in finding ways to draw out narratives combining scientific and artistic perspectives. Reflecting on the relationship that exists between the material and the metaphorical landscape, I'm also endeavouring to reconcile my visitor's perception of emptiness and the sublime with local ways of inhabiting. Well, in the summer, all this is just and just a big bay, nothing but water and a few icebergs. And it's actually, we use this for many things. We can go ice fishing on it. Also, it's a good way to get fresh water. You can see out here, there are a couple of icebergs, frozen solid in the bay. Normally there's a lot more, but at this time of year they've gotten a lot smaller and, well, few. So you have to walk pretty far. It takes about, I guess, one hour to walk out to that one, straight there. And then you cut off ice. Then you bring home, just brush them off, put some water on it to get the salt water off, and then melt it for drinking water. So all the icebergs in this area come from the glacier, Gangia, in Ilulisset. And because of all this ice there is now, we can't get uh, any supplies. But we're used to that. So we used to take dog sledge over here to go to the big city. It's about a um, one, two hour trip on a dog sledge. You can also see it on the way our dogs are put on the sledge. We use a half moon form instead of they do in, uh, where is it? Alaska and Canada. They use the two and two and two. We use a half moon because that's the best way to use when you drive over ice. The dogs, they can change position accordingly to who wants to pull most. The, to, the, the more they are to the center, the more they pull. And down here is where in the summer they bring up whales. So also in the summer you can see a lot of whale bones down here. The last couple of years it hasn't been good ice because it hasn't been so big that we can go around it or so small we can get through it. It has been in between. So all the boats get just stuck in the ice. So we can't go anywhere on the boats. And we can't even use dog sledge because it's not solid enough. So we're kind of trapped where we are because the ocean is our, our highway. That's how we get around. Either on dog sledge in the winter or boats in the summer. That when I was a kid, every day, every single day, you hit, heard sounds that sounded like thunder, but it wasn't. It was these giant icebergs cracking apart. Just one single crack in one of these 50 meter tall icebergs sounded like a thunderbolt. And us, my generation, we grew up with that. We grew up with that sound. And now it's gone. So some of my friends and I, we really feel like that our childhood memories 
are melting away with the ice. I'm privileged to have made friends with these Inuit and Greenlandic fishermen, young Inuit from remote communities, skippers and Inuit explorers, all living among ice. Inuit communities in Greenland and elsewhere have been warning us of the threat to their physical and cultural survival that climate change creates and have been building solidarity links with campaigns against fossil fuels exploration with other peoples worldwide. They are only too aware that the Glacial Brook is one of the world's most productive glaciers and fastest in the world. Within the last 10 years, the glacier has doubled its speed, moving around 40 metres every 24 hours. And in recent years, the glacier front has withdrawn significantly. It calves around 46 cubic kilometres of ice every year. Yeah. And it goes very, very fast. Okay. Okay, the bush. Yeah. Nunan is sitting in Angara Sun of Casatigarugo, a pingy tunan in a mesogonam to Luasa, not to Luasa to Sabo, a top to Chigo in Unicuslo, Pisuchinuclu, Tamaco Acosaga Sap. Nunan Athen Angara Nicum was also Africa Minicum at Tanzania, me, the Sanam Angarat Lunga, Basivara, the Sanuna, sit am so on a me. Inunamin at the Camigo to Am to Luas on the Coop. Tamakami, a Tamakos or Lu Inuyakati at the Kugani. Then I'm Marwinia Tapara to Luas Arsinan at Tutigo. Bisutinuk 
Kenetemi, Angaracatani. A kidinum the quarter to the quartic rat lutes and anger and a slit to inga slagami. Remusra de deceni, Tavaru, a tisha would a cano Tavaru narrasses set Tama Kerwat, a sing Kerwat to Jantesen, a kidinum angerenum me, em, una sopo. So unum am can a two sarci dasunu, Usuinum inurum me, a kidinum meat, a kidinum, a kidinum milsuni, Tamako am idiniaga sapu. E inu ima amasanari a put some milk, Isigis up by torsu, Rianato swartu, Uroyanato do. Kisian itu mangi vipo pasi nasi botan nata. Ayo tahu ya tak segera dua kali. Asal cikgu timaka sor tu pitingi sebab di meruni. Ayo nak usung pisok ya tak segera dua pada sengan nato menu asu ya tak di segera dua pada apa? Apud itu aku cikgu rasin na botan asal kita kau semua akhirnya nampi tak kuat apud sor apud. Aku sah di situ luni asal isi nak asli. Tanya am sokong cik nak tahu isu soal isu itu ngan ni isi ni dah kaya tak tahu ni si orang ni cik uru kaya nak tahu soal isi nak kami ku ada waktu ada wajah kita sendiri tu luar sah sendal tanya asal kita mahu isi ni ku ada macam mana mana isi tu mina pun orang sokong isu soal tu itu di sini apa tu kat tempat tahu ram kau mesti mengira sendal sangat tak. Nak iran ikut kamu sotam nampi begitu arwah soalnya guna maklui nat. Misi gigi saktan iran ikam tak kucaya tang tapo. Pingot si damin nak apa tengi sini apa dah apa ten kanon. Pingot si damin sun tana misi gigi sak. Asi gigi napa iran ikut sol. Pifi sampi visum anggar sun. Artists in the now are answering collective cultural needs and developing active and practical roles in environmental and social issues. I illustrate through my own practice some of the skills and thinking that the artists can bring to environmental debate and to collaborative undertakings. At the same time, I seek to communicate human values to my public. Out of ice extends my creative abilities in engineering minimal environments with water, providing a portrayal of the psychological, physical and the poetic dimensions of ice. It was like a laboratory experiment, offering a way of observing ice water transitions.
She sets ice as material alongside ice as aesthetic object. She sets up Greenland both as a wilderness and as a social space. Film for her is simultaneously an aesthetic and a documentary form. Out of Ice deliberately places the spaces of meditation and documentary alongside each other, with the resulting interference patterns of sound and vision from both factored in. The sensory experience was strong. The video projection and the game of refraction with the installation water mirror remind me of Venice, especially at night, when only the silent waving is heard. But the architectural structure of the installation also referred to a temple, a secret space, where the ice block that slowly smelts is the offering to the gods. And here, the gods and the Olympus are the icebergs of Greenland in deep danger.
Well, I'd like to say something about what we mean by the environment, because I think uh, people are meaning very different things by the term, by the concept, and because they are meaning such different things, they're often talking past one another, and it's important that we uh, understand each other in order to progress with the problem of how to tackle the effects of environmental and climatic change. Because we keep being told by policymakers and scientists that uh, the world is changing um, in ways that could have catastrophic consequences, at least in the longer term, for human inhabitation of the planet. But I often think in the way that people are talking about the environment, I wonder whether they're really talking about a world that we have ever inhabited. In ordinary life, by environment, we mean the world that surrounds us with plants and animals, busily involved in their own lives as we are in ours. And sometimes we forget this, especially when we're sitting inside lecture theatres and conference halls, listening to lectures by people telling us about the environment, but with uh, images on the screen and blinds drawn to cut out the light. And they tell us that the environment is quite different from what we commonly imagine it to be. Um, and this environment is said to be a, a, a global environment. And it, it, if you think about the, the Earth and the globe, um, the globe is quite a difficult thing to think that we inhabit. I, I can think of inhabiting the world that is around me with the, with the earth below and the sky above and the creatures around, but the globe seems like this solid ball and we humans are stuck around on the outside surface of it. So it's a, it's a more general problem of how to link up um, the sorts of knowledge about the environment that people have from inhabiting it with the sorts of knowledge that uh, scientists are presenting with us uh, presenting us with about about it um, so this is the general problem of how to link the knowledge of science with the knowledge of inhabitants It's a bit like a, an, an, an hourglass with um, scientific knowledge at the top and inhabitants' knowledge at the bottom, with scientific understandings of the environment at the top and inhabitants' knowledge of environment at the bottom. And I, I'm not suggesting that we should turn this hourglass upside down, but to turn it on its side so that there can be a, a proper exchange of ideas between what people know from living in an environment and what in scientists can tell us from their observations, recordings and measurements. I mean, the difference between them is this, that, that if you inhabit an environment, you, you perceive it quite directly uh, in, in, in the way you, you, you move around, in your, it, with the senses. It's something that is, is um, so much a direct part of your experience that the environment becomes almost part of who you are. But if you're a scientist, the, the important thing is to maintain a distance. And scientists use instruments and methods to make sure that their own presence does not affect the kinds of measurements they make about the environment. So, so we need somehow to, to bring um, these two things together. And I think there the problems are not so much philosophical problems as, as political problems in that um, traditionally uh, the, uh, the sort of knowledge that comes from, uh, from science has been uh, powerful, has uh, been the kind of knowledge that the politicians and policy makers respond to, whereas the kind of knowledge that comes from actually inhabiting an environment has been, um, has been to some extent suppressed. 
And so we have a situation where, where the, the actual poetics of dwelling, the actual way of being in an environment, is, is put to one side and not recognized as being fundamental to the practice of science itself. So I think what I would want to argue is that we try and move to a situation where, where science also recognizes that, that the knowledge that comes from science has to grow out of a practical, purposeful, intimate engagement with the environment in which they're working, whether it be a, um, a glacier or a tropical forest or whatever it might be, and that, that, that the knowledge grows out of um, that involvement. And, and once we recognize that, then it will be easier to put together that knowledge with knowledge of inhabitants. And once we can do that, then um, we can perhaps better translate the prognostications of scientific research on climate change into practical action that actually can actually be taken to, uh, to try and deal with, um, deal with the problems that we, we face at the moment. I'm looking forward once again to being based back in the studio and thinking ahead. So where precisely is the work leading me? The inquiry into ice presents many choices with its wide range of behaviours, its changeable nature and multiple guises. Inspired by the writings of Thoreau and Emerson, there's the world of ice crystals to celebrate and their unique manifestation of the principle of life. Glaciers and their infrastructure as models of poetic composition and as geomorphic agencies, as well as the ecology of ice and paradoxical aspects of ice to study in more depth. And in the words of Ernest Shackleton, what the ice gets, the ice keeps. So there's also the world of ice coring and its findings to explore. Multidisciplinary collaboration is an energising and inspiring way of working, particularly with exceptional colleagues. Drawing on diverse fields opens up possibilities for art in the present and offers new perspectives. It also naturally extends the audience by association. One of the most surprising strands to develop from out of ice, taking me into fresh territory, is an interactive projected experience, a collaboration in its research stage with game developers and climate scientists. It will fuse real-time ice data and human interaction in a large dynamic wall projection presenting an amphorous abstract ice body created through a tension between data from ice changes and human awareness. The resulting minimal projection is created using a visual network of nodes. It will immerse the player in a compelling participatory space constructed from ice data. <laughs> Poetry, meditative space and the passage of time within the installations are established features, as are my ongoing concerns about the environment. I will continue to engage my audience in immersive and experiential installations which point them toward the natural world and our impact on it, as did out of eyes in unsaid form. Again, water and ice will be both medium and subject in the work, along with new technology and expanding scale to create a sense of wonder, parallel to my own experiences in the wilds. I'm very privileged to have spent so much research time for Out of Ice in the solitude of the Alulisad region, northwest Greenland. Moreover, my childhood in the wilds of Scotland, itself a northern nation, and the legacy of great intellectuals such as Patrick Geddes, John Muir and James Hutton, continue to act as a catalyst for my thinking and philosophy. 
and without a doubt, landscape in Scotland has compelled my imagination and shaped my character. <laughs>